Professor Francis Blessington, poet, scholar, Hellenist, novelist, and translator of ancient Greek drama into verse translation for the contemporary stage. Thank you so much, Therese, and thank you, Maria and Athan of the Greek Institute for having me back here after an absence of several years. <clears throat> So the Greek chorus and alternative tragedies. In the beginning was the chorus. The book of Job claims that when God created the world, the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Choral angels have persisted into the present with more than 250,000 choral groups in America alone, comprising 23 million people. Choral singing is by far the largest art activity in the United States. Choruses have continued since biblical times and in a similar way. They hymn the world with the soul of solidarity. Who are the members of the chorus? Well, they might be in the back of the program, but in ancient times there were no programs. Choral singing has mostly been an anonymous celebration of a rite of unification, a remembrance of belonging. The unit is paramount over the individual. Choral groups even dress alike. Even when in 1978 the village people sang the YMCA song in various costumes of American life, cop, construction worker, cowboy, Indian chief, and soldier, ultimately the harmony of the song compressed even these varied professions and costumes into anonymity and union. I'm spelled out YMCA, symbol of solidarity and an organization of religious origin. The word religion may go back to the Latin legare, meaning to bind together. Within the ensemble are soloists who begin to fly out on their own, but the group catches up with them and they often end on a group note, like the soloist in a concerto. The original meaning of concerto and its later meaning are instructive here. The original Italian concertare meant to struggle or to contend. But in music, it means not contend, but blend, as in to work in concert or put out a concerted effort. Note the ambiguity in English of to struggle with. Does this mean to struggle against or to struggle on the side of? My own choral group, the Reading Community Singers, a group of 82 members, currently reveals these joyous roots. Our title for the last concert was Peace, Love, and Harmony. As we move to the ancient Greek chorus and tragedy, we attempted to call it war, hate, and contention, as if we reverted to the old Italian meaning of concertare. We find notable and noticeable exceptions to such a violent label as in Euripides' Helen and Euripides' Iphigenia and Tauris, which have sent them home happy endings. Like all good works and things, chorus has a Greek origin. Chorero means to dance or to be part of the chorus, as in choreography, dance writing. The dance and song came first in drama, a unity of voice, gesture, face, or mask. Note how much of Aeschylus' plays are choral songs. Gradually, the dramatic action took precedence. Choral poetry began in religious rites and retains its antiphonal structure even today in popular songs. The echoing of priest and congregation in verse and chorus, soloist and group. In ancient Greek, pure choral poetry, without the soloist, is found in hymns to Apollo and Dionysus, but also in many secular forms. Uh, maiden songs, Parthenia, wedding songs, Hymenaeoi, and the dirge Threnos, so common in tragedy. They were sung and danced with elaborate costumes. I don't know where those Greek white handkerchiefs came from, but they, I don't think they were there originally. <laughs> Choral music praised kings and victories. They had stanzas that fell into strophe, antistrophe, and epode, depending on the movement of the chorus. 
Strophe means turn, usually in a clockwise direction. And antistrophe means to counter turn, usually in the opposite direction. And epode was a song that they stood standing still. They had many meters. We distinguish only a few patterns in English whose names derive from the Greek, iambic, trochaic, anapestic, dactylic, spondaic. Ancient Greek has many more meters in addition to these, including Dachmaic, Cretic, and Glyconic, depending upon region of origin and genre. The tragic chorus had at first 12 members. Later, it was increased to 15. While women did not act, it is now thought that women were a part of the chorus. Like the actors, the chorus wore masks. They danced and sang in the orchestra, that is, the dancing floor in front of the skene, our word scene, which was a wooden stage building with twin doors uh, where the actors sometimes entered and before which they always stood. All the action in the Greek play takes place outdoors. There are no indoor scenes. The audience watched from the theatron, which is Greek for the seeing place. As is well known, choral songs like epic simile shift the action to another plane. Homer's comparisons often connect the action of men on the battlefield to the natural world. Soldiers may remember wolves, may resemble wolves or lions, emphasizing the animal nature panting beneath us, or the struggle for a dead companion's corpse may be likened to the stretching of a bull hide or Odysseus's dying suitors may be reminiscent of fish scattered from nets on the shore, twitching out their lives on the sand. In the Iliad, these ships vary the limited range of the poem's action time and place. Critics rightly analyze the tertium comparationis, the thematic link between the two parts of the comparison. That is, the ferocity of animals and men or the brutality of mutilating a corpse as if it were nothing but a bullhide. The chorus also shifts the focus on the action, and critics examine the same third part links. But the reaction of the choric stasimon is very different from Homer's similes of nature and the world of peace. The chorus is a more radical shift from the epic simile for the metrical form changes from the iambic trimeter dialogues to the many intensa lyric measures. The location too shifts from the skene to the orchestra, the dancing floor. So the chorus is always visible and in between the audience and the action. Dialogue shifts to song and dance as in modern musical theater. This conspicuous shift was natural to the Greek audience since drama at first centered on the lyric. Dramatic choruses possibly originated in the dithyram of Dionysian ritual, where it was the only voice. This consisted of a chorus of 50 members. Right. And they preserved, and the choruses preserved some of these liturgical origins in the aesthetics of secular theater. They often composed lyric poems on the action, resorting to imagery, metaphor, that boosts the emotional effect. The tragic chorus is thought to be the conservative voice of society, reacting to the shocking news in a predictable way and lagging behind the implications of the action. The chorus gives information and advice. It sympathizes with the fate of the main character a fate they usually share, and can shift the plane of the action to the historical, mythological, and imaginative sphere. The chorus also delineates the relationship between the hero or heroine and society. Unlike the hero, the chorus is not isolated. It suffers as a group and does not rise to the courage and grandeur of the main figure. It is the backdrop to set the hero off and is closer to us and to the ancient audience. The chorus, as normal society, measures the hero's audacity. Goethe noticed the hero's irreconcilable isolation from society. The relevance of choral song was a crux even in ancient times. 
According to Bernhard Zimmermann, Aeschylus' chorus participate in the action, Sophocles is less so, and Euripides' chorus, choruses mainly sympathize with the hero or the heroine. But we can see a relevance of choruses in all three tragedians. Unlike the epic simile, the chorus reactions are sometimes not to metaphor and image, but to alternative narrative suggestions. They want to tell stories, different stories, from the tragic plot they appear in, alternative tragic tales. In these cases, they are imagining not a natural object or activity, but a possible and different scenario to the action. One, not as dramatic as the real plot, but another literary possibility. Like, the sponged out, like a sponged out ancient draft. Often they present to us an alternative tale that reroutes the artistic possibilities of the action for a moment and is later voided. Their alternative scenarios, really fragments, show the range of possibilities open to the dramatist which expands our sensibilities and gives a voice to alternative actions that yield psychological insights into character and action. In the Poetics, Aristotle commented on the relevance of the chorus. Quote, the chorus, too, should be regarded as one of the actors. It should be an integral part of the whole and take share in the action. That which it has in Sophocles rather than Euripides. With the later poets, however, the songs in a play of theirs have no more to do with the plot of that than of any other tragedy. Unquote. Like Aristotle, we too might well imagine from the choruses other plays that have preceded the present one are alternative plots that can or could have been the present action. But here we can make a case for Euripides too, as well as the other two canonized Greek tragedians. The imaginative choral odes can fit into the plays on two levels. They represent an action that could take place and does not. And on another level, they represent another play that the dramatists could have written. These other versions of the play complicate the plot as in a novel, where secondary characters react to the plot with gesture and dialogue in line with their own thoughts, passions, and value systems. I should point out that what happened to the Greek chorus was, when we come to Shakespeare, that a character now plays the role that the chorus once played in uh, ancient times. Mm -hmm. Without such complexity, the story would be in Henry James's phraseology, rather thin. Mm -hmm. It would be the great Gadsby without Nick Carraway, the, uh, the narrator and conservative visitor from the Midwest, or Don Quixote with no Sancho Panza, the man of meat and potatoes. Both of these characters comment upon the main action from their own spheres and make the novels richer. They are the foils that set off the stone. They are as necessary to fifth century drama as Antigone's sister Ismene is, who could never rise to the heroic. These foils unfold their own subordinate stories, and they in turn aid us in understanding and interpreting the tales by making poignant the actions of the protagonist. How does this work? Well, let's look at a, a choral ode in Aeschylus' Seven Against Thebes. This is a civil war waged by the two sons of Oedipus, after Oedipus' exile. One brother, Etiochus, this is not on your handout yet, okay, so you'll have to control yourself for a little bit. <laughs> One brother, Etiochus, is defending the city of Thebes against the other brother, Polynices. The city is attacked at all seven gates. Polynices and his forces are at the seventh gate. Etiocles determines to challenge his brother, crossing the tabooed line of fratricide. The chorus urges Etiocles not to fight his brother and perform a sacrilege and fulfill the curse of his father, Oedipus. But this could not be the ending, and Etiocles is spurred on to brother murder and to suicide. The chorus pictures the end differently. They remind Etiocles of the taboo against brother murder, as if that is enough to stop the rampaging hero. Oma de sagon himeros exotrune, picro capon andro telen haimatos uthemistu. 
Too much fierce desire drives you on to accomplish a bitter manslaying harvest of unlawful blood. Perhaps your ear caught the, the word, that key word of Greek warning, agon, or in its common phrase, meden agon. That is nothing too much, all in moderation. The unified voice of the community, the voice of the chorus, calls Eteocles back from the precipice of fratricide and emphasizes the difference between conventional wisdom and rashness. But Eteocles feels the family curse and his own brother hate drive him beyond bourgeois concerns for safety. Oedipus's family must be extirpated before order can be restored to this brutal world. Like other Aeschylean heroes, Ateocles is cursed by history and by personal recklessness, neither of which the chorus can conceive. The chorus is often imagines a happier ending, or a more just one, one consonant with the desires of a benevolent audience, but does not fit into the fatalism of the tragic world, where brothers murder each other. Nor is this just a cautionary tale. Argon may remind the classicist of another word playing a role here, argon, meaning struggle or contest. It's in our English word agony. Argons appear frequently in Greek tragedy between characters, and we experience an argon here between the chorus and a character, between the group and the individual. Irvin Rhoda thought the argon to be the basis for Greek individuality. For the contest is, is, is central to the Greek mind. Note their athletic contests that still continue, and even the competition for prizes in the dramatic festivals. Continuing with the Oedipus story, but turning to Sophocles, let's look at a note in the Oedipus Rex. At the beginning, Oedipus learns that the plague that has befallen the city is a punishment for the murder of King Laius, murdered many years before. Oedipus does not know that he is the murderer, as well as the husband of his mother, Jocasta, and that he is the son of Laius. To lift the plague, Apollo demands the apprehension of the murderer. Oedipus proclaims a curse against Laius' killer, not realizing, as the audience knows, that he has cursed himself to exile and pollution. He prays fervently that the killer, kakon kakos nin amoron etripsai beyond, that he will grind down into a miserable life of misery. In the next choral ode, apparently confusing this prophecy with an episode of the television show Law and Order, the chorus thinks that justice will win out in the case. The terrified criminal will flee, they say. Apollo and the fates, like Eliot and Olivia, will hunt down the Cretan. It is merely another case of crime and punishment. Not so Greek tragedy. Oedipus will be found to have wandered where these angels could never have imagined, alone into woods and pastures new. Or consider the opening ode of Euripides Hippolytus where the chorus speculates on the causes of Phaedra's illness and depression. Through the machinations of the goddess of love Aphrodite, Phaedra has fallen in love with Hippolytus, her stepson, and the son of the hero, Theseus, her husband. But Hippolytus is fanatically devoted to Artemis, goddess of chastity, and will not pay even lip service to Aphrodite. So Aphrodite heartlessly destroys Phaedra to kill Hippolytus. Again, such a story is beyond the Kalamos, that is the reed pen of the chorus. They devise other plights for Phaedra rather than incest. The chorus sets a scene, like a frame scene in a Shakespearean play, to present backstory and conflict. They open their road gossiping at a well discussing the main character. The chorus learns of Phaedra's suicidal melancholy and speculate on its cause and possible directions the action might take. Madness was often viewed as possession by a god. The English word enthusiasm means a god is inside. From the prologue, we already know that Phaedra is possessed by Aphrodite, a more intriguing plot than their speculations. First, they wonder if she's possessed by Pan 
hence our word panic. The nature god, and sometimes rapist. Or Hecate, goddess of hell. Or the Carabantes, priest of the great mother Sibylle. But this story is not to be about nature or the underworld or ecstatic religion. Perhaps, they then speculate, she is being punished for neglecting the rights of Dictina, ironically a Cretan goddess of chastity. Uh, that's because Phaedra was originally from Crete. Right. Hippolytus, after all, Hippolytus will be destroyed for worshipping a goddess of chastity and neglecting Aphrodite. The chorus cannot conceptualize something like Phaedra's destruction by a petulant Aphrodite to get at Hippolytus. Their idea of a god punishing a mortal is not absurd. After all, in Euripides' Bacchae, Dionysus punishes those who have neglected his worship. Although that play is more complex. Supernatural speculation over, they shift to the ordinary romance. Perhaps Phaedra's husband, Theseus, is unfaithful. Or perhaps some disastrous news has come to her from her home in Crete. They then suggest that Phaedra is pregnant and praise Artemis for relieving them in their pregnancies. It's a chorus of women. The special irony here is that if Phaedra called to Artemis, Aphrodite would be even more jealously incensed. Such is the extent of their scenarios. Phaedra's later claim that her false claim that Hippolytus has raped her, her suicide, the curse of Theseus on his son, and his subsequent destruction by a sea monster set by Poseidon are all beyond their imaginations. They get the initial premise wrong, but their speculations highlight the more creative and imaginative actions of the tragedy. Let us move further to the conclusion of a play and learn what turns the action should take there according to the chorus. And here I'll be referring to your handout. Euripides is Trojan women. Let us compare the heroine's action with the choral reaction. The scene is just after the fall of Troy to the Greeks, here called Achaeans. The city smolders, the men are dead and unburied, and the women and children await separation, transportation, and slavery. The action centers on the sufferings of Hecuba, once queen of Troy, now the Mater Dolorosa. In one stanza, the Trojan women of the chorus blame Zeus for, for betraying Troy. The chorus has just witnessed Menelaus taking Helen back to Sparta. They are outraged as she is walking off scot-free from the war she has caused, and doubt that Menelaus will put her to death, there, as he promised. In the first strophe, they react in the traditional Olympian way. That is, they blame the gods. Uh, this is my translation. So the first strophe. Could you betray the temples in Ilium to the Achaeans? So easily and altars of sweet incense, O Zeus, and flame of honeyed offerings, the smoke of heavenly myrrh, blessed Pergamon and Ida's, Ida's ravines of ivy wreaths that run with rivers of the melted snow. The boundary struck first by the dawn, the sacred dwelling lit by sunlight. The chorus blames Zeus, who is often the same as fate. Boldly they charge Zeus with betraying his Trojan worshippers, produkas, from a strong verb prodideme, which means to give beforehand and also to give over to an enemy. Making this ode a violent inverted prayer. As is their wont, the chorus returns nostalgically and sentimentally to the sensuous religious cult they have lost. Sweet incense, honeyed offering, heavenly myrrh. With these words, their eyes rise to the blessed citadel of Pergamon, which leads their imaginations to Mount Ida, where a story claimed that the mountain, a boundary of ocean and land, gathered rays of sun from the sea and made them into the sun rising from the east. The naive chorus might believe such legends. In this version of the story, the, wind, the women must accept the outrages of fortune, like Homeric warriors. Let us go to second stanza, which is the antistrophe. Keep in mind now they are dancing here, moving in opposite direction, in the same meter as the original chorus. The, the 
strophe and antistrophe have the same meter. Gone are the sacrifices, the holy music of the chorus, and all night vigils for the gods in darkness. The statues with their images of gold and festivals of the moon in Phrygia that number 12. I worry, Lord, if you care for these things upon your heavenly throne, the burning of the ruined city, attacked by fire and blasted apart. In the second stanza, the chorus still dwells on what has been, specifies further the loss of rituals they attended, hymns, vigils, statues, moon festivals, are no more. They inventory the losses of their traditional rites. We can sympathize with the chorus, shocked by destruction of the city and the deaths of husbands and sons. We would react in the same way, perhaps. The chorus now backs off its accusation against the, the Godhead. Mele, mele, moi, laments the chorus apologetically. I worry, worry. Now Zeus is no longer a betrayer, but he's indifferent to human plights and human rights, as old Homeric gods can be. They stress Zeus upon his throne, admitting his, uh, admitting his high place above them. The implication is that Zeus is unjust and callous. Zeus is found guilty. Perhaps the play will be a theodicy, a story about the justice of the gods, like Aeschylus' Prometheus Bound. The next stanza, the third stanza, shifts to the burial rituals traditionally required of ancient Greeks since Homeric times. Husband, dear husband, dead you wander about, unburied, unclean, while a sea ship fluttering its wings ravishes me away to grazing Argus, where the people live within cyclopean walls sky high. At the gates a multitude of our children cling and cry and cry and cry. Mother, no, please no, the Achaeans pull me away alone without you. From your sight to their dark ship, with sea oars to sacred Salamis, or the Athenian headland, open two ways, where Pelops' palace guards the Peloponnesus. It was believed that the soul cannot go to Hades until the body receives proper burial. The chorus is concerned with what is right and traditionally believed. At the same time, they fear being carried off and raped. Again, they think in terms of legends, that they might go to that Argolid where city walls were made by the Cyclopses of Greek myth. The emotion rises as they see children about to be separated from their mothers hanging onto their mother's necks. So vivid and drastic is the picture, the chorus composes group dialogue for the children, who also speculate on where they might go. Euripides is always good for a geography lesson and does not, shift, does not shrink away from pathos. But the action is not going to focus on nostalgia. By convention, the chorus usually can't act, only react in dialogue or song. This limitation and their conservative nature limits the way they would imagine the action of the play. In the second antistrophe, the chorus's frustration at the injustice of Troy's destruction burst into imaginary action. Second antistrophe. Flashing with lightning, may Aegean's blessed fire hurled with all might strike amidships Menelaus' fleet in mid-sea, since he sends me away in tears in tears from Troy, a slave from Troy to Hellas, while Helen, Zeus's daughter, happens to own golden mirrors, the joy of girls. May he not come back to the Laconian land, his fatherland and his hearth, nor the city of Patane and its bronze-gated temple, capturing his cheating wife, great Greece's shame, that brought such miserable suffering to the river Samoas. The group wishes Zeus's thunderbolts would strike Menelaus' fleet for the ocean of tears Helen has called and the looming slavery of the women. The women do not specify who will hurl the lightning. The implication is themselves if they could. They construct a melodrama in which justice triumphs and the gods cut down the evildoers. The rags they wear contrasted bitterly with the glamour of Helen in the previous scene. And scandalized, they evoke her vanity by the golden mirrors they attribute her, to her in an almost gossipy way. Just as their fatherland and hearth has been annihilated, 
They hope Menelaus will be separated from his homeland, another of many references by the Chorus to hearth and home. Out of piety, they refer to the temple of Athena at Patana in Sparta that should be kept pure by the accursed Menelaus and Helen not returning home. In spite of their suffering and dark future, they still voice their moral shock at Helen's amoral behavior. The note upon which they conclude as oceans of tears resolve into the river Smoas. Their reactions are predictable, though their poetic expression is not. Their prayers for justice will not be answered. As we know from Book Four of the Odyssey, where we find a Helen once more queen of Sparta and united to her husband Menelaus. They are thinking of a play of retribution, like Aeschylus' Agamemnon. But how do they contrast with the heroine Hecuba? The chorus is setting alternative plots as foils for Hecuba's tragedy, which they cannot imagine. Hecuba must overcome the chorus's frozen will and do more than lament. For Euripides, the wishes of the chorus are the normal reactions of all audiences who yearn for deliverance from injustice that must be accepted. As Wallace Stevens said, the purpose of literature is to reconcile you to reality. Hecuba's actions are on a higher plane. Where the choruses are passive, she acts. They lament their unburied husbands, where Hecuba buries her grandson, Astuanox, the son of Hector, with the wretched pomp allowed her. She does not just curse and lament, but challenges Greek visit victors, even the gods. She has no truck with legends about the sea producing a son, no sentimental images about Trojan religious shrines now extirpated. She does not just curse Zeus, but goes where the pieties of the chorus cannot reach. She questions whether Zeus exists at all. Perhaps he is just air, or made up by man. Quote, O support of earth, having your seat on earth, Zeus or air, whoever you are, difficult to know, either necessity of nature or mind of man, I pray to you. In silent ways, you lead all mortals to justice. Although doubtful or fearful of the existence of the God, she prays, uh, perhaps only because prayer is a comforting gesture. O oh, you gods, I summon evil allies. But to calm the gods means something when one of us suffers disaster. Notice the current phrase, oh my God, is that a <laughs> attenuation of this. Beyond the imagination of the chorus, she questions the mythological cause of the war. The beauty contest on Mount Ida, where the judgment of Paris in favor of Aphrodite alienated Hera and Athena. Called upon by the chorus to answer Helen's shameless defense of herself, Hecuba brazenly upbraids Helen for using such weak excuses to cover her crimes. The goddesses did not come to Ida for such childish games and pride in their looks. Did the goddess Hera have such love of beauty so she could get a husband better than Zeus? Or, Ath or Athena hunting for a marriage with some god? She who begged your father for virginity and fled marriage? Don't make the goddesses silly. To gloss over your crimes, you won't convince the wise. She faces reality without the illusions and comforts of traditional piety, and with the bravery of the new sophist speculation. Unlike the chorus who resort to myth, Hecuba rejects the fable of the origin of the Trojan War itself. She encompasses a wide range of mind and act. When Andromache, the wife of Hector, dwells on suicide, Hecuba chides her, my child to die is not the same as to live. It is nothing at all. In life is hope. She could give the same answer to the fallen spirits of the chorus. Yet Hecuba herself despairs and rushes into the flames to die, only to be frustrated by the Greek herald Telthibius. Neither the chorus nor Andromache really attempts suicide. Like King Lear, she suffers more than the younger and more able. We heard the chorus curse Helen and Menelaus, but Hecuba does not curse Menelaus, but tells him in person not to take Helen aboard his ship since she will seduce him again. 
Rather than curse Menelaus, the dethroned queen attempts to use him as the instrument of justice and Helen's death. Menelaus, know my conclusion, crown Greece by nobly killing this woman and set the law for others. Whoever betrays her husband dies. Finally, it is Hecuba who leads the captive women on to endure a life of slavery. In their coral ode, they speculated on being taken to grazing Argus, to sacred Salamis, to the Isthmian headland, inklings of a sad but somewhat consolatory future. Hecuba shall end in defeat, shame, and humiliation, like other tragic figures. But she, will still hero but she still heroically leads, even in slavery. She forces her old foot to the Greek ship. Oh, my trembling, trembling lib limbs make my feet move. Go to days of slave life. As they have throughout the tragedy, the chorus follows her lead. Acting, moving, living, singing, dancing, completing the true tragedy. Their last lyric ends with their acceptance of Hecuba's world. They cease dwelling too much on what has been. Poor city, nevertheless, march to the Achaean ships. Thank you. Yes, he's saying is the dialect uh, Doric in the choruses. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, the, uh, the alpha turns into an eta, for example. Uh, and th there's some other changes. This is one of the indications that drama did not originate at Athens. It is not the Athenian dialect. And so we think that it came from other parts of Greece. For example, the word drama itself means to act, drao, but that's not the, the Athenian word which is pointing. So uh, it, that indicates that it came from somewhere else. So they, uh, that's what I mean. The chorus is the oldest part, and that keeps the oldest language the old, old, of the dialect uh, intact. Also, their conservative nature represents the older religion uh, as opposed to the doubts among educated Athenians. See, the plays are attended to by city dwellers of Athens. This is not the same audience 300 years ago that listened to Homer's epic. And their, their attitude has changed. They're no longer just interested in heroism, for example. They're much more interested in justice, which uh, is a problem. Here, is there justice in the world? Do you believe that there's justice in the world? Do you believe that for Homer there's, there's the gods? Why are they unjust? Well, you can't ask the question. It's beyond your understanding. Very similar to Christianity, although Christianity believes in a benevolent God. The Greek, ancient Greeks did not necessarily believe God is benevolent. But when you get to the polis, when you get to the city, there's much more of, is there justice in the world? Do you believe that how much, more or less, is life just in the, uh, in the long run? So, that, so yes, this, this changes within. We can see an old part of the play in the reactions of the chorus and in the Doric uh, dialect. Mm -hmm. The chorus never goes on the stage. They are in that orchestra, that uh, dancing floor. The, uh, the actors are always back of this. Whether they're on a riser or not is long debated. I mean, you don't want to hear about it. But, uh, and so you're always looking through the chorus. The chorus comes out right after the prologue. That's the opening of a play. Then there's what they call a paradox. Those are the side entrances. Para means side and hados means road in Greek. And uh, they, come, they dance out and then they stay there for the rest of the play. Sometimes the leader of the chorus takes the part of an actor and talks to the uh, actors, talks to the characters. Uh, as you, may, you probably know, there's a three-actor rule. There can only be three actors on the stage at one time. Two, if you're interacting with the Koregos, who is the leader of the chorus. Uh, don't remember, everybody wore uh, masks. And uh, this allowed, of course, people to take on multiple roles, of course. You know, so, as well. <clears throat> it also means your expression doesn't change. <laughs> See, the Greeks did not believe, like the later Christians and the Jews, that character changes. You know, the Christian idea that the next second is the first second of the rest of your life and you can, you can change yourself. 
as King David did in the Old Testament. But the Greeks didn't believe this. Even Achilles, after the end of the Iliad, is still as the angry kind of person he was at the beginning, although he's given the body back, but his, his nature hasn't basically changed. So that fit in well with the idea of the, of the mask and character. Mm -hmm. Well, throughout antiquity, uh, right through Roman times, they, they, they wore the mask. And uh, in fact, uh, mask making was a pretty good profession. Uh, you could, uh, the masks were made of wood, so we don't have any that still exist. Uh, but there were plenty of uh, vase carvings that show what the masks uh, look like. So we have a pretty good idea uh, of what. And they wore very elaborate costumes. And uh, they, they had little rises for their feet to make them a little taller. And so it was a very, uh, but the trouble is that we don't have as much information about the time of the great dramatist, the 5th century. Most of our information comes from the 4th century on. So you have to say, well, did they also do this in the 5th century? So we're not, we're not positive about that. That gets more complicated. Are they related to earlier plays? Uh, a little bit. But uh, the same thing happened as happened in the Middle Ages in Europe. Uh, they, they came from uh, religious ritual. And maybe in the same amount of time. It took, in the Middle Ages, something like 75 years for the mass to develop into a secular play. There's something like that happened in ancient times, too. So originally, uh, probably not too far before, let's say, Aeschylus, uh, there was supposed to be Thespis. He was supposed to come along and invent drama. It was a debate as to whether Thespis was a person or somebody made up a lie and put it in the books. Uh, and, uh, it happens. <laughs> so, uh, so if there is, there's not that much earlier. So we definitely can see a development between uh, the Dithyram, Seder plays, and uh, what happens with, uh, with the Greek plays. So in other words, it bloomed rather rapidly as to what happened. So people then stop coming for they're going to participate in the Dionysus ritual of dance, and they're going, I'm coming for the show. You know, this is a good show. And this is what happened in medieval cathedrals, that, you know, it, it started off the unbloody sacrifice of the cross, and then all of a sudden there was, there was fun. I mean, there was the, the three Johns all running to get the, to the body first to see if Jesus was there and pushing each other down. And uh, it developed rather quickly. And so it then changed to uh, secular subject matter. So by the time we get the three major dramatists, the drama is pretty much secularized. It, it's, people are interested in the aesthetics and the emotion. They're no longer interested, even though the priest of Dionysus still sits in the, in the seat. If you go to the theater at Athens, you can still see where he sits, and that little altar we think was always there. But it's, uh, it's purely aesthetic now. It's the drama is uh, going to be for the sake of the story. That's why people are, are coming. They are chanting the dialogue. Uh, you get, of course, as you may know, uh, opera was an attempt to recreate Greek tragedy uh, in the Camerata of Florence. And so that idea of the recitativo as opposed to the aria. Uh, we think that uh, Greek poetry was pitched in fifths, and so you have this rising and falling uh, of the voice. Uh, so it did sound like that, but the choruses are much more song. But when you come to Euripides, many of the plays, the actors sang much of the play as an aria. For example, in the Hecuba, something like the first couple of hundred lines are all sung as a, uh, an aria. And uh, they're not in dialogue form at all. So more and more, uh, it, it went back to kind of musical origins uh, with the very often the main character singing uh, a commence, singing a, a lament with the chorus. This became very popular. And uh, we don't know a lot about the music, uh, we know that the music was more melodic than harmonic. Uh, and of course, if you've read Plato, you know that the, the different modes that they are uh, there and that he talks about in the, uh, at the end of the Republic. Okay. Uh, he wrote the words. 
Uh, and certainly the, the biggest problem was uh, training a chorus. It, that, that, took, that could take four months to train a chorus. Uh, they were not necessarily professionals, and so did the dramatists write the music too? Probably not, but we don't know much about, much about that. But they definitely wrote the words. And, uh, and in this case, the, uh, the words came first. And then the words were, the words were set. Okay. And they, there was a flute player and usually a drum. That would also. That was going to be my question. What do we know about instruments? Well, we know those two because, of course, they play a big role in. Uh, we have pictures of the double flutes, uh, the all loss, and uh, so we know that that was, that was played. Uh, and of course, uh, the drum, because originally the, the drum was used in Dionysian worship, and, and that seems to have stayed. So the, at least we're sure of those, of those two things. Uh, yes, the connection between uh, nature, don't forget that these plays were performed in the morning and daylight, uh, and that they were performed outside. It's not like it, you go to the theater, it's dark or it's at night, and you got a low roof over your head, and you're sitting there in the dark with a bunch of people you don't know watching sex and violence on the screen. And, uh, you know, it's a very different kind of world. Uh, the Greeks was open, yes, and you saw that sun. You see, they would start early in the morning at sunrise. And uh, people would bring food and they would talk. And you know, it's, it's not like the conventions of a modern uh, audience. Uh, audience at all. But yes, uh, Homer believed, and they kept this up, that Human beings are connected to nature. Homer says this over and over again. The way the, the lions, maybe it's violence, but we behave the same way the animals behave. Fear, violence, courage. Uh, and man is connected to the, to the natural world. And originally the, uh, the gods were animistic spirits. Uh, as you know, they, you can start to equate here Zeus is the rain and here is uh, the sun god Apollo and you have so on and so on. Uh, they either come from abstractions or they come from personifications of human nature or they come from aspects of, of nature itself. Uh, but the first thing people did was, well, nature is like me. They grow, they die, they get replaced. Uh, you know, we, we share the same pattern. And uh, that certainly underlines the, the Homeric simile and some of these things in nature. Because you get a lot of this in nature. Because there's an old tradition that Euripides started as a painter before he became a dramatist. So there was, uh, we don't know if that's necessarily true or not, but there certainly is a great deal of attention to natural imagery. Yeah, so the connection with uh, the chorus and uh, the audience, they really filter the, the emotions into the audience. And don't forget, one of the most powerful things was their dancing. I mean, it, it gets your whole body in motion uh, with their song and their dancing. They really take that emotion that they get from the episodia of the scenes, and they hype that into poetry and song and dance into the audience. So as I tell the students, you really have to imagine this chorus is not just standing there, they are actually dancing, they are actually trying to bring, they're actually trying to convince people, not only through words, and, uh, but rhythm and bodily motion uh, to, be, to be joining in this. In, in Greek comedy, it's even more so because there, it is a parabasis in which the, uh, the chorus comes up and talks to the audience. And uh, they talk about politics, or they talk about contemporary events. And in one of uh, Aristophanes' plays, they come up and they say, look, you crummy jerks, you're not putting up enough money for the, we're wearing rags because you don't put up enough money for the drama performances. So we get this, uh, this breakdown almost completely between the chorus as something different, and and the uh, and the. But as I said in the very beginning, they are the way we would react. We're going, oh no, you know. Every time Oedipus uh, comes out on the stage, he goes and destroys himself again by asking those silly questions all the way through the play. And you keep hoping, no, don't do that. And uh, so Jocasta says, no, stop here. Don't try to find out who you are. But of course. Uh, you know, know thyself. This is the Delphic Oracle. This is this is Greece all over. You got to know yourself. Well, he knows himself and destroys himself in the process. Of, so, uh, but you, this is uh, the the audience. The uh, chorus tries to to uh, be us, trying to hold back that tragic hero who just 
goes on and uh, and therefore the the chorus is, is more on our side in a way in that in traditional behavior they want justice and very and very often Greek tragedy is, is about not getting justice and what do you do then okay sometimes it happens it happens in the Helen and it happens in the Iphigenia and Tauris it happens but uh, usually it does not and then you need the Greek tragedy to help you with that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the audience, uh, actually, they sometimes would pay you to go to the theater. You would get three obols to go to the theater if you could not pay your fee. Uh, actually, the, uh, the plays were paid for by rich citizens. There was a list as to who was the richest and so on. And like the first so many names would then be assessed that they would have to pay for the chorus pay for prizes and so on and so that's what they did so it was really uh, in charge by the state and of course uh, they also use this because Pericles is going to use this to show Athens is the school of Greece this is the great world here we're leading the world in thought and art and so a lot of this including the Olympic Games were trying to uh, show off uh, Greek culture to the uh, to the world so yeah you could you could actually get paid to go if you didn't have the, uh, the money to go to the theater. Cause, because everybody went. It's the only act in town. And uh, so there's not a lot of video games around or something else that you can, uh, that you can go do. Uh, so uh, businesses would close. Uh, this is the, the Greater Dionysia, the Lesser Dionysia. These are big festivals. And Greek festivals are religious in the sense of community. They all participate. There's no Bible, there's no liturgy. Uh, if there are songs to Dionysus that compose new, new every year, they, they don't, there, there's no such, there's no Ten Commandments. The, uh, I mean, there's a code of behavior, but there's nothing codified uh, about it. So this is very important, the, the festivals, because it was a way of, well, it was their own past too. I mean, these were, in, in Euripides' time, they're saying, well, I don't know about some of these stories. They're very hazy. They happened a long time ago. It's like you seeing a play about King Arthur. Was there a King Arthur? Well, you know, there's probably not. Or he probably doesn't have much in common with the representations of, of King Arthur. But so that's sort of the way. It, but it's still ours. It's, it's, uh, it's, our, it's our culture. It belongs to us. And... Therefore, we're going to make it into, you know, something new. As I said, it's going to move from a heroic culture to a culture that's interested in problems of family, problems of foreigners, problems of women, problems of justice. The, the many, and this is why Greek tragedy is alive today, because it had a way of generalizing what they were interested in in an exportable way. So you can perform it anywhere in the world, and it means something to people because it became part of universal experience. It was not just what happened. Drama can be very particular. You know, guerrilla theater is just about the latest failed revolution or something, and therefore it dies on the vine because it's too specific and particular, and those issues didn't last. But the Greeks had a way of taking tremendous problems, uh, things you don't even want to think about. Uh, mothers killing children, uh, the, the, and putting them on the stage, not just writing secretly about them, but I mean making public entertainment out of it. So it goes, it goes very deep into human nature, and that's one of the reasons for its success. Yes? Well, they would win prizes. So, by the way, there are only three playwrights, and so if you came in third, you didn't get anything. So sometimes these textbooks say, well, Euripides got the third prize many times. <laughs> it means he lost all those times. <laughs> So uh, yes, you would uh, you would you, know, you would get paid and you would win you would win prizes. So uh, they would win tripods. There. And if you've been to Athens, you've seen some of these. There's still monuments around where the winning actors are, are dedicated their tripods to the ro uh, roads there that had the uh, the plinths anyway remain. Where the tripods were were on top of them. So yes, everything was competition. You see, that was that was the nature of of the Greeks from the Homer 
on. It wasn't Sesame Street, let's all get together, you know, and, and <laughs> you know, that we're going to see which city state's going to win, who's going to come in first. And uh, it's like uh, the games in Pindar that he records. And when, you know, if your city state lost, uh, people threw rocks at you when you came back to the village if you were a losing athlete. I mean, this is serious, serious competition. You know?